Hi, my name is Keller Johnson Thompson, and I have dedicated my life to furthering the legacy and teachings of my great grand aunt Helen child Helen Keller became an international celebrity the first person to escape the double dungeon of dark My name is Keller Johnson Thompson, and I have dedicated my life to furthering the legacy and teachings of my great grand aunt, Helen Keller. As a blind and deaf seven year old child, Helen Keller became an international celebrity, the first person to escape the double dungeon of darkness and silence, to effectively communicate with a world she could not see or hear. She was the first such disabled person to graduate from college the first woman awarded an honorary doctorate degree from Harvard University, and she authored 13 books. She assisted Lions Club International in their worldwide journey in sight advocacy, which continues today. Her diligent work on behalf of the American Foundation for the Blind continues to inspire and change the lives for those who have suffered with sight loss. Helen Keller was a movie star, and she won an Oscar. Helen Keller became America's goodwill ambassador to the world, befriending every U.S. president during her adult lifetime. She visited 37 countries with greetings from America. Braille was accepted as the world's standard alphabet for the blind, thanks largely to Helen's eloquent pleas for standardization. She envisioned and publicly demanded that America become a truly inclusive democracy long before it did so. She effectively advocated for the rights of women, children, minorities, immigrants, and the disabled. By her example and writings, she permanently brought discussion of disabilities out of the closet forever. Anne Helen was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor, and Time Magazine called her one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. The world still needs Helen Keller's examples of character and values.
I'm uh, Dr. Fred Figliano, and I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 26th Annual Helen Keller Lecture. We'd like to start out with the singing of our national anthem. I'd like to ask Sarah Jane Houston to come up um, and, and uh, lead us in, in that song. The Keller Lecture Series began in 1995 to raise awareness of the challenges to those with physical limitations, particularly those affecting sensory ability. Every major undertaking has a champion, and at Troy University, our champion is Mrs. Janice Hawkins. Thank you, Mrs. Hawkins, for your leadership in starting this, uh, this event and in, and in uh, continuing it for the, for the past 26 years. Thank you, Mrs. Hawkins. Troy University is also blessed to have a dedicated senior leadership team. I'd like to introduce at this time. First of all, we have Dr. Carrie Palmer, Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Mr. Sohail Agbatwala, Senior Vice Chancellor for Student Services and Administration, Mr. Brent Jones, Director of Athletics. Uh, thank you all for your leadership that you provide to, at Troy University. Troy University is fortunate, is fortunate to have the support of several important agencies and organizations that make this event possible. And we have several special guests as well this morning. First, and you'll hear about our speaker in a little bit, um, we have obviously Danny Gilroy and his family is here. Wife Elizabeth, sons Aiden and Rory, parents Dan and Kathy, and in-laws Bill and Charlotte. Please rise and let us welcome you. Next, I would like to thank our partners. Um, from AIDB, we have Dr. Dennis and Debbie Gilliam, Ms. Becky Watson, Ms. Carissa Twyman, Ms. Jessica um, Edmiston, and Mr. Kathy, uh, um, Andy Keith. Please rise and let us, let us thank you. From the Alabama Department of Re Rehabilitation Services, we have Mr. Uh, Bedarius Bell. Please rise. Major agencies have good sponsors. Thank you. Um, from the Alabama Department of Mental Health, we have Mr. Steve Hammerdinger. Steve, thank you. From the Alabama Department of Education, we have Mr. Michael Sibley. Is Michael here? 
Thank you, Michael. And then from the Helen Keller Foundation, we have Miss Keller Johnson Thomas, who was also the great grandniece of Helen Keller. Thank you. Okay. Um, events such as this also require a lot of planning behind the scenes. And so I want to thank a few people that have made this event possible. And so first, Mrs. Judy Robertson, um, Mandy Hobbs, Rachel Arnold, and Andy Ellis have all played an important role in making this. So let's please give them a round of applause and thank them. I would also like to thank our interpreters for today's event, Brian McKinney and Aaron Enos. Thank you both. Now it is my honor to introduce a gentleman who has led Troy through an era of unprecedented growth. Dr. Jack Hawkins Jr. became Chancellor of Troy in 1989 and today is the longest serving CEO of a four year public university in the country. Under Dr. Hawkins' leadership, Troy University has been transformed from a regional institution to a doctoral university which tru with truly international in scope and prepares graduates to be competitive in a global stage. During his tenure, academic standards for admissions have increased, new degree programs have been started, and we have entered um, the highest level of NCAA competition. So it is my honor to present the Chancellor of Troy University, Dr. Jack Hawkins, Jr. Thank you, uh, Dr. Figliano, and thank you for all of you for being here this morning. It's such a pleasure to uh, come together on this annual basis. This Helen Keller Lecture Series was established in 1995, and it was for a very specific purpose. Uh, my wife and I, actually it was my wife who introduced me to the world of low vision and blindness. Uh, because she was recruited to the School of Optometry at the University of Alabama, Birmingham to help start the low vision program there that has been so instrumental in helping people who have uh, sight problems uh, capture their remaining vision that's possible. And it was through her influence that we were privileged and actually blessed to serve the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind for 10 years. And it was then, as a child, I met the current president, Dr. Dennis Gilliam, because both of his parents, wonderful people, work for us, at, uh, work with us at UAB. In fact, I think I worked for his mother. Uh, both of his parents were deaf and uh, wonderful educators and wonderful people. So, Dennis, thank you and all our colleagues for being here uh, this morning. We are here for a very important reason, and that is to uh, focus on low incident disabilities. And initially, that was sight and, and and hearing, but it certainly broadened over the years. Uh, and it really is to help us remember uh, the very few who really are challenged at that level, but the numbers have gotten longer. Uh, it's too often we forget those who experience the low incident disabilities, and they really don't need uh, a handout. They need a helping hand, and that's what we're in the business of doing is to help all of our students and all the people of this state, nation, and world realize their potential. This has been a very important series. We've had some distinguished lectures throughout the, the history of the program that included the, the late U.S. Senator Howell Heflin, who not only was the estate attorney, but he was also the personal friend of Miss Helen Keller. The beautiful Miss America, who happened to be the first and only deaf American to ever achieve at that level, Miss Heather Whitestone. Mr. Eric Weinmeyer was actually our very first. Eric uh, lost his sight at age 13. He didn't lose his vision. He went on to scale every tall summit in the world, including Mount Everest. So he is, he is actually a uh, has actually gone atop the seven major peaks of the world. And then, of course, we had Miss Patty Duke, who uh, portrayed Miss Keller on stage and screen. 
Today, we're ha actually honored to have another great actor, and I'm delighted that he graduated from Troy University. And I'm thrilled, too, to see that several of his former professors are here to make sure that he hasn't forgotten what they taught him. Dr. David Dyer and his wife, Dr. Judy Dyer, here, retirees of Troy University, and, of course, uh, the great Dr. Phil Kelly honored us and is honoring us here this morning. So I welcome them back to our ranks. Uh, we'll never forget the important role that each one of them played, particularly in students like Danny. Danny graduated in 1992. He earned a degree in theater and dance, and he went on to work professionally uh, on many different stages, uh, including the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. After working in theater, though, Danny had a different calling. He was called to the ministry, and over the next two decades, he worked in church choirs, directed church activity centers, and led the program Kids Stuff. He earned a Master of Divinity to go with his Troy degree. He did that from Asbury Theological Seminary, and then pastored three churches over the next 10 years, and those churches included Echo Alabama, Enterprise Alabama, and Pace, Florida. Indeed, it was during his experience in PACE that Danny was stricken with a rare condition called transverse myelitis. Literally, his immune system attacked his spine instead of attacking the virus that he faced. It left him a quadriplegic. But despite the setback, Danny never lost hope. He exemplified resilience and leadership by continuing to pastor his church for another three years. In November of 2020, Danny felt the call to step back from pastoring and took to another stage. He transitioned to motivational speaking and becoming a spokesman for the health company Octavia. It was Napoleon Bonaparte who said, courage isn't having the strength to go on. It's going on when you don't have the strength. Indeed, that's what we've seen in Danny Gilroy, an example of true courage. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had many courageous speakers throughout the 29 years of this lecture series, but I would say very few have demonstrated displayed the courage of our speaker today. Please join me in welcoming home to Troy University, our distinguished speaker for the Helen Keller Lecture Series, the talented Danny Gilroy. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. going on everybody glad to see y'all thank you dr hawkins for that wonderful intro on october 17th 2017 six years and four months ago this saturday i only know that because the 17th is a saturday but six years and four months ago i woke up and i got out of bed and i felt this uh pressing around my stomach and my lower back with a whole ring of it like a ring like saturn and and it was pressing in on me and it was obnoxious and it hurt and i knew i needed to go to the hospital right our brains are just we don't even understand half of it right or more than that three quarters of it the capacity of our brains but i knew i needed to go to the hospital sometimes i would walk around saying do i have to go to the hospital for this or that but i knew so after my wife got out of the shower got dressed real fast and she told our children that of what was happening I don't even think I saw them three of them were at home at the time uh, two were in high school one was in middle school we went off to the, the hospital So uh, feel free to come up and do what you got to do. The battery's on and everything. So anyway, you hear me in the back? Yes. 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 All right. So uh, we headed to the hospital, and and 
Uh, we drove up to it, we went around with it, where the emergency room was. And uh, I said, well, just park right there. That would be a spot. I mean, so we picked a spot. I wasn't thinking anything of it, really. So, I mean, I didn't think that, there we are. I, I didn't think, you know, I couldn't walk, right, or anything. But when we got in the car, not only was my stomach get this band was pressing and hurting, one of my legs was already going numb. So I put my arm around my wife and we were about 15 to 20 yards from the uh, emergency room doors. And whenever I talk about this walk, I remember it. And I don't just remember it. I mean, I can feel myself walking into that, towards that hospital door. So we walked to that hospital door where we were met by a wheelchair. And I sat down in that wheelchair and I never got up again. What do you do with that? Right? What do you do with that? They rolled me off to a room and my wife stopped at the desk, obviously, to check us in. So I guess I lied. I got onto the table somehow. I don't remember how I got onto the table, but that was probably the last time I got up technically. And I was on the table and I could feel this happening to me, right? I knew, I told you our brains did these no things. I knew that if I could just keep my leg rocking, everything would be okay. I mean, right? I mean, I just knew. Why did I think that? I mean, I had no idea to, to know what was going on. And I laid there, laid there. They're trying to figure out what's wrong. And eventually that leg just stopped, just stopped moving. So now the paralysis is right about here. I don't really know it's paralysis at the time, but it's right about here. So I'm laying there and they're trying to figure out what's wrong and they're ruling out stuff. And I happened to look up at the clock and it was quarter to 10. And at that very moment, I felt this explosion in my stomach. It just, just that's, all, I don't, that's the only way I know how to explain it. What was happening is the paralysis was climbing and my organs dropped. That's where they were dropping. I'll never have a six pack. Mind you, I didn't have a six pack before, but I'll never have a six pack because my organs are there and I always have this little pooch no matter what I do. But that's what it is. So it's climbing and I can feel it happening. Ultimately, they sent me to a room. I didn't know why, and I still don't know why to this day. And I got sent to this room for observation, and my secretary came to talk to me after she had been at work with, at the church where I was a pastor at the time. And, and I remember when she left, my wife, Elizabeth, went outside with her to see her off. And I remember looking at the clock. It was quarter to one. And at that moment in time, I felt this explosion in my triceps, just just like exploding out. And that is the moment that I started to freak out. Up until then, I'm thinking, I'm in a hospital. I'm going to be all right. They're going to fix me, right? I mean, that's why we go to the hospital to get fixed. That's what I'm thinking. But I freaked out because my diaphragm was compromised, right? And I, I've learned, right? I, I had to do it today for a second. I can't get as loud as I used to. I can't sing as high as I used to. But at that moment... I, I couldn't yell out at all. It was very, very weak because it was just happening. Here's what else I couldn't do. I couldn't push the stupid buttons on the hospital. No one was in the room. I couldn't push the stupid buttons on the hospital thing to get hit the call button to get anybody, right? So I'm freaking out. Like, these are my hands, right? And I could, I could do it now. I could push the button now. I can hold a bottle of water. You saw me grab it. It's a little awkward, but I can do that, right? I can use my phone. It's over here. I can type. Uh, iPad is preferable because it's easier, right? You've got to push. I can type on it. I can drive a car, y'all. I drove here this morning. But then, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome, right? I have a, I have a, a, a tri-pin that goes on my wheel. And it turns the wheel. And I, I pulled, I wasn't going to tell you all this, but, but uh, I, I pulled a go and pushed a stop. It's like a boat, right? Except for the tribe, it's like a boat. All kind of things. But, but then I couldn't. I was, I was so freaking out. My wife came in, and I could probably see it in my face. I don't remember much for the next month that happened after that, because most of it was spent in ICU. And usually I have to stop here and say, I need to tell everyone what I have, because I always forget, because of the story, Dr. Hawkins took care of that. I've transferred my lightest, like he said, and my immune system attacked a virus. They never found out what a virus was. 
uh, inside me and it didn't attack the virus, it attacked my spine. And it crushed it, y'all. It crushed it. My neurologist calls me impressive. <laughs> Everyone wants to be called impressive, right? However, when your neurologist calls you impressive, it's not for the reasons of your really outsmarting him. The images of my spine, when you see them in MRIs, is just a white line. It looks like it's not even there, right? That's how much it crushed it. And the question is, what do you do with that? You sit down, and I remember that walk. I got to the hospital, went in. Less than six and a half hours later, I was paralyzed from the chest down. I'm a C6, C7 quadriplegic, right? That's where it stopped, ultimately. What do you do with all that, right? That becomes the question. What do you do with that, right? And, and here's the thing. When you answer that question, it can turn into more questions and, and more what ifs and why is this happening. Let me tell you why, right? I want to tell you two things about the ICU. The first is this, because it's important to the story. About seven days in, I crashed. I mean, bad crashed. I had a, I had a internal bleed somewhere. They didn't know where it was. I had an infection called C. diff that you get when you have ulcerative colitis, right? I was getting medicine for headaches that I probably shouldn't have been getting, and I had septus, right? It was bad. And my wife was at the nurse's station, and when the red lights went off, right, it's not called code red, that just on TV, it's called something else. But when the lights went off, the nurse said, sit right there, just sat her down. And my wife, Elizabeth, explains it like TV, it's like a TV show or movie. And people are running everywhere, you know, and throwing on their coats and going and getting whatever they got to get right to fix me. that I saw the white light. Okay. But it was bad. But all of a sudden, it turned around. And the nurse came out after things had turned around much for the better. And blood count better. Bleeding stopped. I mean, it was just amazing, right? Miracle. She comes out and she says to Elizabeth, I don't know what happened. I've never seen that before in all my time here. I mean, usually it doesn't work. And she stopped herself, I think my wife does, because she didn't want to say, usually, I mean, I, she would have known what she was talking about. Usually it doesn't turn out so good. It goes the other way. And again, she said, I don't know what happened. I've never seen it. I don't know what happened. Now, I'm a pastor, y'all, so I know I'm in a place of higher education, but you know what I believe if I'm a pastor. My wife looked at her and said, I know what happened. God happened. Right? God happened. So when I ask, what do you do with this? What do you do with that? I say, what do you do with that? I'm here. Right? So it all becomes this question. And again, I told you that, that when you answer that question, other questions can occur. Here's the other part about ICU. Found out at one point that my swelling started climbing up my spine. And it got to C4. Right? Now you're pushing a state where you can't do what I can do now, right? You're, you're pushing. And they started giving me steroids, and it brought it back down to C6, C7 where it landed. So the questions I start asking is this. What if some brilliant mind had given me steroids when I got to the hospital? Would I have numbness in this leg and would I have to just use a cane? Would I be paralyzed at all? I don't know. Right? You don't know the answer to the question. But the questions continue. What if someone had given me steroids when I was paralyzed from here down? Would I be a paraplegic instead of a quadriplegic? I'd be able to get a six pack then because I'd have the muscles. Right? I'd be able to function a lot differently. Not saying one is more significant or less significant than the other. But it'd be a lot different, right? I might be able to use the bathroom like you use the bathroom and not have an indwelling catheter. Right? But I don't know the answer to that question. And then as it climbed up to my stomach, I'm thinking, what if they had given me steroids then? Because here's what else I'm told. I haven't researched it myself because I don't want to go there. 
But I'm told that if the swelling had stopped at C8, I'd be able to use my hands. Right? My hands tingle, half of my hand on both of them tingle. I'd be able to use my hands like most of you in here can use your hands. That can drive you crazy. What are you doing? Well, here's the deal. Maybe it's because I'm bumping this. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. So, all right, so I'll try to stop, y'all. I'm, I'm sorry. So, 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 so when I think about what do you do with that, there's two ways to go with it. It's to ask questions that you don't know the answer to or to do something else. I can't keep asking those questions. Because when you ask those questions, what happens? You stay right here. This is where I would stay. And I, this is all I would be thinking about. Wondering why, what's happened. I know you saved my life, God, but why is all this other stuff? Why did it, right? That's not who I am. That's never been who I am. That's just not in, in my mentality and my makeup to just sit there and dwell on something. I'm not saying it's not hard. My wife would tell you, I'm not saying there are times, there are moments, but for the most part, right from the beginning, I can't stay here. That's just not who I am. So there's another way to answer that question. But before I do, I want to include you all, right? And, and people would say, well, you came to tell us your story and stuff. Everybody is part of the story. Everybody you run into is part of the story. We are all part of the story this morning. So I want to be inclusive to you. It, 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 it doesn't say I'm a teacher outside my name. It says Danny Gilroy, alum and motivational speaker. So that's what I try to do, right? So here's how I include you. I believe everybody has a paralysis in their life. And mine and yours, are no, no one's is more significant or less significant than each other's. You might be a teacher in this room, right? And you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I don't know if I'm getting through to my students. It's different students, but it's the same class, right, that you teach a lot of times. And you just don't know if you're getting through because they're not responding. And your focus could get turned to that in such a way that it paralyzes your life. That's your paralysis, right? And in many other situations, you may be a student. One of my paralysis is, if that's such a word, when I was in here at Troy and in college was... Why do I got to take all these general studies courses? I'm never going to use them. That's not part of my major, right? It, I focused on that so much that I put off Western Civ One to my last semester here. Now, part of it had to do with I wanted to take a certain teacher, and he was like Indiana Jones, and he always went off on sabbatical. I finally got him, right, the last semester. But the other part was I just put it off. Right? It became a cup of paralysis, these questions, that it can par paralyze your life. Relationships. All students have relationship issues at one time or another. People in this room have relationship issues at one time or another, right? And if you focus on them and you ask questions about them, it, it, it paralyzes you right where you are. That's your paralysis. You might be going through a, a death in your family or a death of a friend recently or within the last, it might be 10 years ago. And you still can't get past it, right? And, and you focus on it so much and you ask questions that can't be answered. That's your paralysis, but it can paralyze your life. You might have your own sickness. You might have cancer or leukemia or paralysis or a bad back. Yes, that counts to me. Or, or a bum knee, right? I bumped it again. Or a bum knee, right? And, and you might be so focused on what's going on in that situation that you don't really move on in your life and you stay right there. That's not who you were meant to be either. Told you that who I am? That's not who you are either. So let me tell you how I answered this question. What do you do with that? And now, I know we're in a place of higher education. I'm going to use a story from the Bible. I'm not going to preach. Okay? I'm joking. I'm not going to preach. But I do need to share the story. You know this story, even if you don't know the Bible, right? So in the least preaching way possible, is there's a story in the Bible about David and Goliath. Everybody has heard that story, even if you don't go to church, right? It's the story of the little guy versus the big guy, right? The underdog versus the favorite. Someone who had to face this giant. How do we face our giants? Lessons taught. Well, there's one aspect of the story that we rarely, rarely talk about. 
But before we do, we need to know kind of what's going on. So to remind you maybe, or if you've never heard before, Goliath is a Philistine, David is an Israelite, and they're constantly fighting each other. And the Israelites have had the upper hand a lot of it this time. So I guess Goliath wants to take things into his own hand as a Philistine. Now Goliath is a big dude. All right, we're going to talk about him in a second. But basically, he's told his army, I got this. And every day he walks out, there's this valley, and they're on these two sides. And, and he says, just send one person. And if they beat me, we'll bow down to you. And if I beat them, you can bow down, you'll bow down to us. Now, again, I told you Goliath was huge. Some texts tell us he was nine and a half feet. Some texts tell us he was seven and a half feet. He was huge, okay? Think Shaquille O'Neal. If you don't know who Shaquille O'Neal is, go Google him after, afterwards, not now. Google him afterward. He's a huge, right, seven foot something. Goliath was bigger than that. And not only that, when he came out, he had this helmet, bronze helmet on him, added a foot to him. He had this coat metal on that was 50 or 60 pounds that made him bigger. And he had this spear behind him, and he had this huge 15 to 20 pound sword. Shaquille O'Neal, a foot taller, two foot taller, standing there, challenging somebody no one wanted to go with that mess with that right i mean it's huge david tends to sheep he's the youngest of like seven eight sons right and he tends to sheep for his father three of his brothers are at this this war and he brings provisions for them one day and while he's there goliath comes out and david looks around and says what's up why are y'all going to fight him i mean what's the deal David, again, not in a non-preaching way, knows who's on his side, right? So it doesn't question it. Now let's explain David. David is young. He, they say he's handsome. They say he's ruddy. He can kind of command a room, and he keeps the sheep. Think Michael J. Fox before he got his sickness, right? If you don't know who Michael J. Fox is, just click through the stations one night, and you'll see Back to the Future. It's on all the time. And you'll see him, little guy traveling around in DeLor DeLorean, right? Michael J. Fox Shaq, that's who he is. That's who David is. So he's saying, why don't you go challenge him? His brothers chastise him. The king says, you're crazy. And David finally says, I can do it. I kill lions. I kill bear. I can do it. Somehow he convinces the king. The king says, I'm going to help you out. Put on my armor. Take my sword. So David, Michael J. Fox, puts on this bronze helmet, puts on this coat mail, grabs this sword that is very cumbersome, and he probably tries walking around in it. And I think of the moment in Big, if you've ever seen that movie, when Tom Hanks goes from being an adult back to being a child, and we see him running into his house, and he's still got on the adult suit, and he's still got on the adult shoes, and he can't really move in them, right? Think of maybe your grandkids or your kids. They go to the basement or the attic and they find your clothes if you're an adult, right? And they put them on as little kids and they come parade in front of you. It's just too big, right? And David looks up at one time and says, I can't do this. I'll get killed. This isn't who I am. That's not who I was meant to be. So he throws it off and he goes to the brook and he pulls out some stones and puts them in his pouch. And he walks out with his confidence and with his knowledge and with his skill, he walks out to meet Goliath. There's a lot we could go into here. Goliath laughed. Goliath said, this is what you're sending me? Shaq says, you're sending me Michael J. Fox? That's what you're sending me? Right, right? This is crazy. And at some point, when Goliath is laughing or talking and he's probably pointing to his army, look at this. David takes that sling, and it's not one of these things, y'all, like we get in the gumball machines when we're little. It's this probably stick, and it whips around like this. And somehow he puts that stone in there. I don't know how. I'm not skilled at slingshots. And he whap, whap. And Goliath goes boom, boom, boom. And he kills him. And what we can glean from that 
and what I learned from that, David, David had a, what do you do with that situation, right? What do I do with this? What did David do? He used what he had. I'd say he used what he got. He used his knowledge. He used his skill. He used his confidence. He used what he had, not what he didn't have, what he had to take down Goliath. And not only that, David didn't think about, now again, I know who he knows is on his side, but he didn't think about what could happen or what might happen or what was going to happen. He didn't ask questions like, I wonder if when I knock Goliath down, because he had the confidence he'd do that, if this whole army is going to come at us. I wonder if our army will respond to it. I wonder what's right. He didn't ask questions, right? He just stayed in the moment. I had friends in, in high school, a lot of them who took Latin, right? I took Spanish. I thought it'd be easier. What do I know? I don't know if it was easy or not, right? I don't, I don't know, right? I don't know because I didn't take Latin. But I remember the day they learned carpe diem, right, which is seize the day. This is before Dead Poet Society, if you've ever seen that movie. So that wasn't a thing at the time. They walked through the halls in the, during our breaks between classes saying, carpe diem, carpe diem. And I said, I'm not impressed, carpe diem, right? I mean, seize the day, right? I understood what they were saying. They were having fun with the word, and it meant a lot to them, that, that phrase, seize the day. But here's what David did, right? You can't seize the day unless you seize the moment. Moments make up the day. It's called, and I'm sure there's somebody in here in this place of education who can finally tell me how to say this right afterwards, acupandi temporis. I don't know if that's right, all you Latin people, but acupandi temporis, which means seize the moment. And that's what David did, right? We have to seize every moment we have to seize the day. To me, that's more important. So David used what he had to seize the moment to bring hope to the community in which he was a part of at that time. That's what we glean, to me, from that story. That's how we answer that question, what do you do with that, right? We use what we got to seize the moment, right? to bring hope to the community in which we're a part of at that time. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. It doesn't matter whether you're retired. It doesn't matter whether you're an athlete. It doesn't matter what you're doing in life, right? We are meant to, 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 to use what we got to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community in which we're a part of at that time. When I got out of the hospital, I was there for two months, two months. Elizabeth put me on disability, my wife, because she didn't know what else to do. I said, get me off. <laughs> get me off. I got out of the hospital on a Friday. Now, none of what I'm going to tell you right now is conceited or arrogant. It's just how I answer the question. It's just me. I told you I couldn't stay in this place. I got out of the hospital on a Friday afternoon. And Sunday morning, because they were desperate for their pastor to come back, I rolled up in that church and I led service. And I preached, and I used what I got, a voice, and a way to create a message. I used what I got, as long as I had the microphone, right? Although I'm getting better at that, we found out. But I used what I got to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community which was a part of it at that time. You don't think they had hope then, when I rolled up in that, that, that building? So that's what I do. I speak. I share my story, right? I use what I got because I can talk. I use what I got because I think I have an ability to put together a message. I use what I got to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community which I'm a part of at that time in the hopes that that's what you'll do. Because listen, a moment is all we have. A moment is all, trust me. I walked into a hospital, sat down, and six and a half hours later was paralyzed. A moment, you don't know what's going to happen when we walk out those doors. This is our moment. So that's what I do. And, and I'm going to keep doing it. Let me tell you why. In September, I did a talk. Not this talk, but they all kind of relate. 
And somebody came after, up to me afterwards, who I know, kind of, and a little bit older than me, and he said, thank you. And I said, you're welcome, <laughs> right? He said, I have been in Afghanistan for over 30 years. I have been in Afghanistan since I left. That's the Gulf War that started when I was here in college. That's Saddam Hussein. And he said, I have been there for over 30 years. And I'm ready to leave. Wow. That brings tears to your eyes, to mine. I'm like, I'm not going to stop talking. He got through to somebody and got him out of a place he was stuck. He got through to somebody and got his paralysis, kept his, stopped his paralysis from paralyzing him. So you use what you got, no matter who you are, to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community in which you're a part of at that time, right? That's what we do. And again, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You aren't, I hate to say this like this, an athlete, a chancellor, an actor, a, a, a beautician, a garbage collector, a doctor, a lawyer, retired. You are that. That's your occupation. But through that, you can use what you got to seize the moment to bring hope to the community in which you're part of at this time. I'm doing pretty good on time. I was told a certain time, right? But I'm going to land the plane like this. There was a movie in late 1994 called The Shawshank Redemption. Now, it's 30 years ago. The patent on spoilers is over, okay? I can't spoil the movie for you now. You should have seen it. And basically, it's about this guy named Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins. And there he meets Red Morgan Freeman, who is in prison for life and who knows how to get things, right? So Andy got sent to prison for a crime that he didn't commit, murdering his wife and her lover. He didn't do it, right? He's innocent. He gets sent to this prison. And over his time there, the warden realizes this guy knows numbers. This guy's smart. This guy knows a lot of things. And he goes to work for the warden. And he is doing wrong for the warden, but he wants to survive, and he gets this library to run, all kind of things. So long story short about the movie. He, somebody shows up who can prove he's innocent. The warden throws Andy in the hole, and so he won't talk, and he has this guy killed. About 20 years have gone by now, I mean, when, at this moment. Andy gets out of the hole and realizes the warden is never going to let him leave. And he has this conversation with Red about what he would do when he got out. And Red says, I'm an institutional guy. I don't know what I'd do, right? I can't, I don't know how I'd live. And Andy says, I'm going to, I'm going to go to San Juan Tanea, And I'm going to, I'm going to, it's in Mexico. And I'm going to buy a cheap motel. And I'm going to buy a boat. And I'm going to take people charter fishing. That's what I'm going to, I could use a man who knows how to get things. And finally, Red gets frustrated and says, Andy, I don't think you ought to think about that. The fact is, that's down there. And you're in here. You're in here. And that's down there, right? It's just, I mean, Andy, come on, get a hold of yourself. And he says, you're right, that's down there, and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. You either get busy living or get busy dying. That night, Andy escaped. He had dug a hole. He would gotten a rock hammer from Red, and he knew geology. And over time, he had dug this hole through his cell, and he escaped. But I won't talk about that. What I want to focus on is what he said. Life, that really is. You have a simple choice. You either get busy li living or get busy dying. When we allow the paralysis in our life, bad back, bum knee, bad relationship, death in the family, right? Anything, whatever it is, no more significant or less significant because it's your story and it's your part of the larger story. But when we allow that paralysis to start paralyzing our lives, we get busy dying. That's just a plain and simple truth. We get busy dying. But when we look at that paralysis and we look at that giant, we look at that shack over there, and we say, you know what? I'm going to use what I got. Right? I can't walk. 
I've learned how to do some of my hands. There's a lot of things I can't do, but I'm not in an I can't world, right? I'm in an I can. And when we start facing our giants and facing our paralysis, we, d- we rip off the way it paralyzes our life. When we use what we got to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community in which we're a part of. And that's when we get busy living. And we were meant to live, y'all. We weren't meant to die. We were meant to live. And let me tell you something at the end of this. You use what you got to seize the moment to what? To bring hope to the community in which you're a part of at this time. Because let me tell you something. The world needs hope. And I said I wouldn't preach. But the world needs hope. And when you get busy living, you give those around you hope. Trust me. Listen, I had a, my dad tells me all the time about guys in his Bible study and men he knows. And when I go on Facebook, he says, he says, man, everyone to a man says, you're so inspiring. I say, why? I don't know them. I don't know them at all. He says, they just say you do. I had a next door neighbor in Pace, Florida. And, and, and uh, I never really talked about this with him. And my parents came to visit one time and he told my father I was so inspiring. And I said, why? I never talked about this. And probably because he sees me roll up in a car and get myself situated and drive off in it. Right? That is using what I got to seize that moment to bring hope to the community I'm a part of at that time. Right? We are all meant to be that. So I'm at the terminal. And it's just simple today, right? It's very simple. We all have a story. We all have a paralysis. How are you going to deal with it? What are you going to do with that? Let me encourage you to use what you got to seize the moment, to bring hope to the community you're a part of at that time. I want to thank Dr. Hawkins for inviting me here. So much. It meant so much for me to be back here. So I thank you very much for trusting me. I hope I lived into that trust. We got together back in July again on a recruiting trip. He brought this up to me, and I didn't hesitate. So I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. I'm glad you were here. Go be the light. This concludes our program. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.